ready yet? Well, for goodness sake, hurry up. The bus is not going to wait all day. Well, you broke the record that time, Captain. Yeah. <laughs> 21 minutes flat. Catherine is my only daughter. That is why I make this long speech when she leave home. Well, I don't know, Papa. I almost missed the train when I was drafted. Uh -huh. Oh, I remember. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, you you had plenty of time. <laughs> you are the youngest, Peter. That is why I worried about you. Oh, please, Papa. Don't worry about me. Oh. I worry, Katrina. I don't like to see you go. Catherine will do nothing that will not make us proud of her. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Papa. Katrina, yeah. you be sure to drink plenty milk now. I you don't have to remind a Holstrom to eat. Oh. You drink a quart a day. I will, Papa. We better start, Catherine. It's getting late for the bus. Yes, Dr. Matson. Goodbye, Mama. Take good care of yourself. I hear me that too. Good thing, Nadai. Chara, Mama. Goodbye, the letter I promise you to the Swedish hospital. I tell them you will be a good student and that you will work hard. Oh, thank you, Dr. Matz. And when you graduate, you will come back to my hospital as a nurse. Yeah. It's always good to have young people come back to the place where they were born. But if you have any trouble, you let me know. No, Dr. Matz. Papa says we must stand on our own two feet. If I have any trouble, I work it out myself. Good. The bus is late. I would like to wait, but I have so many calls to make. Of course. Goodbye, Dr. Max. Goodbye, my little flicka. Oli clearisa. Susan Duck. Want a lift? Oh, no, thank you, Adolf. I will wait for the bus. Pushing right into Capital City. Save you $2.53, Katie. Oh? You bet. Have you ever been to Capital City, Katie? Not since I was three years old. I would have been there two years ago, but my brothers went into the army. I had to help out on the farm. You'll have a much better time now that you're uh, grown up. I hope so. Take a drink. Take a couple. Oh, uh, no, thank you. I drink only glug at Christmas time. That's not strong enough for a painter. Oh? You see, a painter's got the paint in his mouth. Mm. And if you don't wash it out, it dries there and hardens. That's not good for any man, painter or no painter. <laughs> Start.
20, 40, 50. 20, 40, 50. Okay. Watch where you're going next time. It's cheaper. For two cents, I'd bust you in the nose. Adolf, don't be so tough with my money. Ah, smart guy. I'll need a welding job on that, and it'll cost you 25 bucks, but I can't get a torch till in the morning. Tomorrow morning? Yeah, if I'm lucky. But I can't stay here all night. Let's not get mad at each other, Katie. It's my Jeep that got wrecked. Yeah, it was your Jeep. But it's my money. Katie, <laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to advance me another 25 bucks. Adolf, you were going to save me $2.53 bus fare. And now it's going to cost me every cent I have. What about my nursing course? Katie, you'll get your dough the minute I see the boss painter in Capital City. I don't know. Of course, you could hitchhike tonight, but it'd be kind of dangerous. Better wait and go with me in the morning. Well, time's a-wasting. Do I start on this Jeep or don't I? Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good morning. Have you seen the... The uh... man that was with you last night? Yeah. No, dearie. He's been gone a good hour. Gone? Yeah. Didn't he tell you? No. No, I didn't see him since I went to my room last night. Uh-huh. Thank you. How far is it to Capital City? Sixty-five miles. The tear the fish that's a kunda pinta. Kunda pinta. Nightingale. How are you, honey? I've been looking for you. All morning. I ain't in the phone book. I went to the painter's union. Kind of anxious to see me again, huh? Uh, you bet. Tired, ain't you? Here's just the thing to knock it. Adolf, my $75. I want it. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I'm sorry, dear. I didn't tell you. I'm fixing it so you can deduct that from your income tax. A bad debt, see? No. No, I don't see. I made that money for nursing. You are going with me to see the boss painter? Oh, don't get so tough, honey. We got lots of time to worry about money. Then I'm going to get a policeman. Yeah, do that. Yeah, I will. And while you're gone, phone your family. Yeah, and don't forget the people at the Swedish hospital. Phone them all. What? Tell them we had a little trouble on the road. They'd be very interested. Especially the part where we had to spend the night at the motel. They are the fish to some kuna hinder. Ah, you both! Don't fall on me! Come in. You. You who are you 
yourself. I'll be right with you. You Catherine Holstrom? You know me. The agency told me. Got a uniform? No, Mr. Clancy. You know me? Yeah, the agency told me. What else they tell you? Well, they told me that you were the butler. Mm -hmm. And if I could work the day out for you, I could work any place. Mm. You can wear one of Lena's uniforms. She's the cook. Sick today. Oh. Picked a fine day for it. Luncheons, cocktail parties. You can change in there. Thank you. Hope you'll be so good to me. to an apron. Thank you. Gotta make it all right? Yeah. The two of us could get into it. These two-story drips. How do you expect to make good coffee in them? The beatings I take around this house. People in this town scare their kids by telling them I have to drink Clancy's coffee. Have you got the real coffee pot? Yeah, thank you. Newspapermen look at it, the public will go to the polls and vote exactly the way the machine tells them. To. Oh, no, Van. I don't think the voters will stand the kind of baloney the politicians have been dishing on the pet. Oh, hold it, Virginia. A brandy. Kills the taste of Mr. Clance's coffee. Ooh. I forgot. Van? No, thanks. I've been on the city hall beat for two decades, Glenn, and I'll be bribed if I can see any change. Oh, thank you. You've seen so much corruption, you're cynical. Get that Ginny. She's been writing a dope column for three years, and right away she's Sam Graff. <laughs> no thanks. Okay, fellas, you're the old timers. But didn't I stick my chin out? My beautiful little chin out. My beautiful little chin out three weeks ago and say that Glenn Morley would be re-elected congressman? No thanks. Did I or didn't I? <laughs> Some long shot. That's like betting there'll be snow by February. <laughs> anyway, Ginny, you're disqualified. You're in love with the guy. Everybody knows but Glenn. Mr. Clancy, you didn't make this. Katie did. Good. You bet. You were saying, Glenn? Oh, oh yes. Uh, I didn't mean the change in voters' attitude had been a prairie fire or a revolution or anything like that. But remember a fellow named Otto K. Uh, Otto K. Uh, Schmidlap. Schmidlap. Yes, he was from around Mineral County. Uh, Red Wing County. <laughs> Red Wing County, yes. He served two terms in Congress. It... Maybe it was three terms. It was three, Mr. Morley. Three times. What's your point, Glenn? Glenn, if you were about to say that old Schmidlap was the case of a congressman going down the line for his party, right or wrong, you've got an argument. Your friend Schmidlap was strictly second rate. Oh, no, sir. Mr. Schmidlap was not second rate. He was first rate with a second rate party. Boing! <laughs> and what makes you America's authority on good old Otto K? Oh, he was our neighbor at Red Wing County. He was a good neighbor, a good farmer, and a good man, like my father. Hello? Oh, Sweeney, how are we doing? Swell, I'll tell the congressman. Looks like we're about 600 ahead in the toughest precinct. Good. Congratulations, Mr. Morley. Oh, thank you. What worried were you, Glenn? Well, this is only my third term in Congress. I've still got opening night jitters, Mr. Clancy. Well, I think I'll go back to the shop and dream up a color feature on how Glenn Morley looked, felt, and acted in victory. Good luck, Glenn. Thanks. Going to an opposition headquarters and see if I can get a statement. I 
Aren't you guys coming back for the cocktail thing later? Free champagne. No champagne man, me. So long, Glenn, thanks. Be when you, next you see me, the time will be 6.30, and I'll knock you dead with the dress I've made out of some old parachutes. Happy landings, Jimmy. One for you and one for the house, eh? Well, that ain't a bad split. The old senator would have settled for that any time. Did you know the senator? I've been with the Morleys for 40 years. Oh? I was with the senator when he made his first million. We came here together. Oh. We went to Washington together. Part of us died together. When you get through with that bird food, get on these glasses. Yeah, Mr. Kratz. Joseph? Hello, Agatha. Late. Who's here? No one yet. How's Lena? Still complaining. What's the doctor say? Same as usual. Either she gets a new liver or we get a new cook. Oh, oh Ma, where have you been? Down to headquarters, my little man. How's everything going the 14th for that ward healer, Morley? Morley's no ward healer. Know the boy well. Wonderful to his mother, they tell me. <laughs> Unless I miss my guess, and be re-elected by the usual majority. Hooray for the party. Party? Fiddlesticks. The voters did it themselves. <laughs> Party's getting filled with fat boys. I've been thinking about that. We'll have to thin them down a bit. We should have been here earlier. We had coffee. Real coffee. Set out for it? Uh, the extra girl Mr. Clancy hired. Really? Maybe she'd do for a second maid. Oh, uh, what'd you say your name was? Catherine Holstrom. Oh, this is my mother, Mrs. Morley, Catherine. How do you do, Mrs. Morley? Mr. Morley says you did very well this afternoon, Catherine. Would you like to work for us? Y you mean steady? Yes. Well, I, I do have to earn some money. Anything wrong with our money? Oh, no. I need it so I can start my nursing course. But uh, I would not be permanent for more than uh, two months. That's permanent these days. Well, that's settled. What can you do, Catherine? Well, at home, I do everything. Uh, make six beds every morning. Uh, do washing, ironing for Mama, Papa, my three brothers, myself. Uh, clean all seven rooms and do dishes, of course. And I help Mama with the canning. I preserve meat, candle eggs, dill pickles, smoke ham and bacons. I wait on table 40 hands at harvest time. And I make glug. You do? Yeah, at Christmas time, with a hot poker. Uh, you want to know what I do outside? I don't know about my mother, but I'd be fascinated. Well, I plow with horse and tractor. I hoe potatoes, shock wheat, milk cows, uh, bed horses, butcher pigs, kill and dress chickens, and I cut wood for mill or stove. You got a job, Catherine. Thank you, Mrs. Morley. Now, look, there'd be a lot of talk about politics. Just stay out of it. Of course. Johnson to have Glenn Morley as your teammate in Washington. Don't I know it, Nordic? I can't tell you how grateful I am to both of you. Oh, Mr. Johnson, you've already been elected. We'll probably have to do some fence mending for the next election. Yeah. Congratulations, Glenn. Thanks, Ma. I was saved by the bell last time they conceded two hours earlier. Is that Charlie? Yeah. yeah. Hold on.
something to eat, miss. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, did you vote today, my dear? Oh, I couldn't vote, sir. I'm not registered in the city yet. Oh, I'm downright sorry to hear that. I'd have considered our victory a complete success if a pretty girl like you could have voted for me. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. If I could have voted, I wouldn't have voted for you. Mr. Clancy. Uh, no, Mr. Clancy's taking a little vacation from running up and down stairs. I guess Mr. Clancy thinks he's getting old. Don't let Mr. Clancy hear you say that. No, I won't. Hmm. Yours? Of course. suppose these photographers know what they're doing. Don't you like it? Do you? It's better than at Mr. Johnson's. Say, what is this feud between you and Johnson anyway? I don't think he has a good heart for the people. In what way? Well, why is he against the higher minimum wage? How do you know that he is? Because I heard him on the radio, and he said it was up to everyone to look after himself, and I believe that, too. But I think that everyone has a right to a living wage. Well, just what, in your opinion, constitutes a living wage? I, I, I believe the man who said, a living wage depends on whether you're getting it or giving it. Uh, would there be anything else, Mr. Moore? I don't know that. That's quite enough. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, why don't you learn to keep your big mouth shut? Get off the bus at the corner of 6th and L Street, then walk two blocks to 8th. Turn to your right and go one block east. Is that clear? I think so, Mrs. Morley. Katie isn't leaving us. No. She's just going to buy some uniforms. Thank oh. you. Will you give me the money to pay for them, Mrs. Morley? Just charge them to my account. Thank you. I'll be back as soon as I can. All right. 
Does she know the way to White's? I wrote the directions down. Uh, morning, Agatha. Morning, Joseph. Well, I think I'll be getting along. What for? Why, I'm having lunch with the governor. 10.30? Well, I've got a lot of people to thank, you know. Breakfast go all right? Oh, superbly. That's what I figured. Be a good girl. Give my regards to the governor. Hop in. I'll save you 10 cents bus fare. Last time I saved bus fare, it cost me $75. <laughs> Just tell me the story of your life sometime. I will, Mr. Morley. Sometime. You know what kind of uniforms to get? Yeah. Mr. Clancy said we got something very plain. Mr. Clancy has no imagination. A new uniform. They all come? Yeah. How many did you buy, Katrine? Uh, I, I'm afraid they sent 12, Mrs. Morley. Uh, exactly what I ordered. Twelve. Two black, two blue, two maroon, two gray, and four simply charming little informal numbers for housework in the pre-luncheon period. We're going to pay for these, Mr. Moneybags. It's your house. I sure feel like a tramp in my old blue serge. have this prescription filled. Take one every three hours, and I think we can knock it overnight. What did people used to do? In the old days? Mm. Oh, they ignored it. They were smart. Sure, they were smart. They never called for a doctor till they were good and sick. When a man caught cold, he treated it by going out in the snow and chopping wood, getting awfully hot. Then he came in, drank a lot of liquor, got even hotter, went out in the snow to cool off, got awfully sick, and died. What's the matter with you? What's the matter? Nothing. I'll call you up in the morning, Agatha, and see how you are. I can tell you now, I'll be bored. That's part of the treatment. When do you go back to Washington, Congressman? Oh, just after New Year's. I'm checking in a couple of days early. Well, good luck to you, Glenn. Thanks. Goodbye, Agatha. Be a good girl now. <laughs> you do exactly as he told you. I wish you'd stop getting into a tizzy every time I sneeze. Well, it so happens, Mrs. Wise Guy, that you're the only mother I've got. Joseph, tell Katie Glenn's ready for his breakfast. Oh, you might have had to wait a couple of minutes. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, what's the matter? Nothing. Uh, what did the doctor say about Mrs. Morley? Oh, it's nothing at all. Just a sniffle. Oh. Probably be all right tomorrow. Oh, that is good. Then it will be all right for me to speak to her today. What about? Uh, to give my notice. I have saved enough money. Well, certainly, she's well enough. Give. What, what are you talking about? My nursing. Oh, I thought you'd forgotten all about that. Oh, no. Aren't you happy here? Yeah. Well, it's the work. Is it work too much for you? Or? No, no, there's nothing More wrong. More time off? No, or? there's nothing wrong. I just want to be a nurse. Well, if you want to be a nurse, there's a... And you remember our agreement. There's a very sick woman right down the hall who needs you. Someone besides your mother. Well, just because my mother doesn't complain is no sign that... You know perfectly well that a cold can turn into something else, and that something else can turn into, uh, well, if you're going, you're going. I am sorry to leave, Mr. Morley. I've been very happy here. You certainly seem in an awful hurry. 
Uh, you mean now or in general? Both. Well, uh, today is my day off. Where are you going? You mean today? Skating. Hope you have a good time. Thank you, Mr. Morley. I always do. This telegram just came. Well, what do you know? I'm leaving for Europe tonight. No kidding. Come on, let's tell Mom. Ma. Ma, oh, I'm leaving for Europe tonight. Ooh, skating all the way? Uh, House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on United Nations Economic Planning. Long name, good committee. Four of us take off in New York tomorrow at noon. Be in London next day. What time are you leaving? Got to be at the airport at 8 o'clock. Virginia's coming to dinner. Better telephone her to come early. Well, you call her for me, will you, Ma? I've got to get some exercise. Be careful. They don't want you to go to Europe in a hospital plane. You realize, of course, you're talking to the captain of the greatest hockey team Yale ever had. Uh-huh. What's she running for? She told me all about it. Seems that running keeps her in shape for skating, and skating keeps her in condition for running. Sort of a vicious circle. Ah, oh, here comes our captain. The argument seems to be, is Katie going to skate, or is Glenn going to run? Glenn's going to run. Mm. Poor Glenn, he won't last one lap. You're wrong. He's not going to let her make a sucker out of him. Are you willing to back your judgment with cash? Ten to one says he's in there at the finish. The usual ten? The usual. Anything wrong? I, uh... I think I'll skate now and, uh, limber up afterwards. There's your ten cents. Hey! going to Europe tonight, like Mr. Clancy says? Yes. Are you really worried about your mother? Oh, <laughs> she'll be all right. Oh. I was just trying to think up some way to make you stay. Uh, would you be happier if I stayed till you came back? All right, I'll stay. I was just trying to think of a good reason to stay. That makes me very happy. I hope Glenn doesn't forget the ice gets awfully thin down by the boathouse. Well, he went through the ice there last year. He couldn't be such a dumbhead. I'll get you ten. Two bits this time.
Thank you, Joseph. Still feel cold, Glenn? Oh, I, I, uh, shoulders a little, a little, a little stiff. I, uh... Come in, Katie. Come in. That's right. I want to be starting off to Europe with a chill. Yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> What's that you're giving him? Glug. Mm. We pretend it's Christmas. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Clancy, you can throw away the hot water bottles. You know what would really fix up those shoulders, Glenn? A good mm. rub down. Good idea. Call up the athletic club and have them set a man out right away. There wouldn't be time, Mr. Morley, to get the man all the way out here. I'll have to do it myself. Glenn, you all right? Sure, he's all right. Get back to your room, Agatha. Fiddlesticks. Katie's going to give me a Swedish massage. In reverse. He's already had the cold plunge. And that's the captain of the greatest hockey team Yale ever had. Mr. Morley, will you lie right down there at the foot of the bed, please? Won't it be cold? Not in a minute. Uh, Mr. Clancy, the stool over here. And the feet. Oh, there. This goes under your chest, like that. There. Now, we begin. Oh, please relax. You're very tense. Now, don't be nervous. I have to get the kinks out of your back. Mm. Is there anything you can't do? Oh, yeah. Too many things, Mr. Morley. You have three of the most unusual talents I ever heard of. I bet you're the only girl in capital. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who can give a Swedish mm -hmm. <laughs> Make clog, clog, clog. Uh, and call hogs. <sighs> I'm beginning to feel better. I'm beginning to feel terrible. I don't mind that you tease me. Because I know how different I am from Miss Thatcher, for instance. Would you like to be like Miss Thatcher? Well, not quite so nervous. But when I'm around her, I feel... I feel strange. I know I talk different from all of you, but... around her, I talk worst. Why don't you go to college? And take care of Mrs. Morley at the same time. Well, university extension course at night. Uh, speak to my mother about it. She thinks you're very smart. Oh, yeah? Oh, they have all sorts of courses. Uh, Political science. <laughs> and, uh, you can hardly go and take all that. Oh, God, come here. <laughs> Hello, Virginia. <laughs> oh, looky, looky, what fun. What's oh, going on, Clancy? I never suffered so much in my life. She's been murdering us. Is this restricted to the family, or do you take out patients? I'd be glad to give you a massage. Any time, Miss Thatcher. No! Oh. You're finished, Mr. Morley. Thank you. Seems to have been a mixed skating party. Lucky thing Katie was there. No doubt she saved your life. I'm grateful to you, Katrin.
Is everything all right in here? Oh, yes, Mr. Clancy. We don't have to waste any more time in here, do we? No, Mr. Clancy. Learning anything at that night school? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Clancy. Last time we learned why all the leading nations went off the gold standard. Did they? Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, it was a move toward the nationalization of the world banking system through the social control of credit policies. Is that so? Mm -hmm. Think of that now. <laughs> How's the diction and public speaking getting along? Oh, I am worried about that, Mr. Clancy. Tomorrow night, I have to have a speech memorized, and I don't know what to do. A speech? Mm -hmm. Turn that thing off. Come in here. Maybe I've got something that'll help. One of my favorites here. This may be just the ticket for you. The afternoon the Senator made it, Mrs. Morley and I are in the gallery. Yeah. Go on, Katie, read it. Stand right there. Now, you're the Senator. You've got the floor. The chamber's pretty crowded this afternoon. Senator LaFollette, Glass, Underwood, Lodge, Borer. A lot of speeches have been made. Good ones, too. You stand and you're recognized. A sort of a hush falls over the chamber. Mr. President, today I don't want to make a speech. I want to tell you a story about a doctor named Sorensen who lived in a small town. He was a good doctor, but the rich people in this town didn't like him because he told them the truth a little too often about their imaginary sicknesses. Things got bad for Dr. Sorensen and he moved across the tracks to the poor section of town where people needed him but didn't have the money to pay. He worked for them anyhow. They would give him a bottle of milk when he cured a sore throat or a loaf of bread when he set the broken leg. Dr. Sorensen couldn't afford a regular office. He practiced in the room he lived in, upstairs over a livery stable. The shingle outside was a simple little sign that read, Dr. Sorensen, upstairs. Well, even doctors get sick. And after working years with these poor people, Dr. Sorensen got sick and he died. And all those people who loved him and whom he loved buried him. They wanted to put up a big marble monument, but they just couldn't afford it. So they took the sign from the stable and put it over the doctor's grave. There it stood. That was his monument. Dr. Sorensen upstairs. Today, a president has died. Only a short time ago, his dream, the League of Nations, was killed by people who couldn't stand the truth. But his dream shall not perish from this earth. It will live in the hearts of good, common people. For over the president's grave, the people have placed their everlasting monument, which, like the doctors, reads simply, Woodrow Wilson. Upstairs. It's beautiful, Katie. What does it say? Welcome home. Glenn will love it.
Catherine. You're wearing your hair differently. Oh, I'm glad you noticed. I think I liked it better plain. It's Miss Thatcher. Oh, hello, Virginia. Darling. Who's here? Mrs. Morty. And darling. Right away. It's very it's urgent. Sharp, we'll wait in no, the library, no, no, and I'm sure no. she'll see us when you tell her how important it is. Yes, Mr. Norton. Uh, don't disturb her guests. No. It just goes to show one never knows. It's Mr. Nordic. Really? What is it, Hi? Agatha, I'm afraid we have bad news for you. We've just had a phone call from Washington. What's wrong? We've lost a congressman, poor Wilbur Johnson. What happened? When? It's really a great tragedy. He dropped dead an hour ago. Dropped dead? Oh, no. No. Here, don't do that. She's fainted. Katie, what's happened? I don't know. We were in the library talking about Wilbur Johnson. Welcome home! Has she ever done this before? Shutting the door because I didn't want to. Glenn! Ma. Hello, Glenn. What happened to Katie? Well, she fainted. I think she thought you were the one that dropped dead. Dropped? Oh, you mean Johnson? Mm. Told me at the airport. Katie. Uh, uh, you all right? Uh, oh. Uh, yeah. You all right? Come on, Katie. You better lie down. Yeah. Sorry to spoil your homecoming, Glenn. Better go in the library. Gotta work fast. Joseph, get Miss Thatcher's coat. You'll find the list of guests on my desk. Telephone them. I know what to say, Agatha. Sorry, Virginia. I'll go quietly if you'll give me a beat on who's replacing Johnson. I think you'll just go quietly. Edgar Alistair Peter Feather II, Frederick Palmer Stewart, Theodore Cummings, Anders J. Finley, and uh, Tony DeCorda. You can forget every candidate but Peter Fee. Why Peter Fee? Gentlemen, Colonel Peter Fee was my regimental commander during World War I. No finer example of American manhood exists in this town. Could we elect him? He'll get the service vote. If you'd heard as many mothers complain about Colonel Peter Fee's command as I have, you'd realize he couldn't be elected garbage collector, which he is. I resent that. Quiet, Eckers, or you'll have to go home. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's getting late. Tomorrow, the governor will have to announce a special election to fill the vacancy caused by Wilbur's death. We must make up our minds. Read the list again. Edgar Alistair Peter Fee II. Frederick Palmer Stewart. Feel better now, Katie. Theodore Cummings. Yeah. Anders J. Finley. Tony DeCordo. Wait a minute. What about Finley? Well, good political background. Best kind of business connections. Present personality. Did pretty good as a commissioner, served two terms. I served five sessions with him on the council. His record as alderman is enviable How and How would he be for the women? Inoffensive. Oh. Any objections to Finley? None? Well, is it Anders J. Finley? Mrs. Morley? Mm hmm. Eckers? Matternan? Uh huh. Sweeney? Uh huh. Glenn? Well, that's it, gentlemen. Let's eat. Tomorrow night at the mass meeting, I want you to introduce Finley as our candidate. Okay. We'll be a lot happier with Finley than we were with Johnson. I promise you that. Thanks, Joseph. Colonel Peter will be awfully disappointed. What's he got to kick about? He's still garbage collector. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's some of the cake I made for your homecoming. Thank God. <laughs> you bet.
been skating lately? Uh, no. I tried it once in Switzerland. It was much fun. I tried it too. But I kept looking around for you to fall through the ice. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I want to thank you for taking such good care of my mother. Oh, I'm glad I stayed. I thought a lot about you while I was away. Uh, we thought a lot about you too, Mr. Morley. Oh, I'll fix it. You didn't approve our choice of Mr. Finley tonight. Oh. Well, I, I don't think he's any improvement over Mr. Johnson. What do you know about him, anyhow? Oh, I know his record. And I heard him speak one time when he came through our county. He has a very bad record. Oh, so you're an authority on Mr. Finley, too. Well, for one thing, why did he stop free milk from the grade schools? And if for you don't like him, don't vote for him. Oh, don't worry, I won't. I was only asking you, why did he stop the... Don't ask me. The... Ask Finley. There's a big meeting tomorrow night. Ask him. He'll be there. All right, I will. Oh, all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Morley. I... I didn't mean to upset you. Upset me? I'm not upset. Good night. country is safe! Yeah! Guiding the ship of state! And I tell you, in every summer vault in the Paspaloose, you'll find a histolash arrest about the election. And now it is my privilege to introduce the next speaker. Your former alderman, your former commissioner, your next congressman from the 13th district, Anders J. Finley. <laughs> Maury's 
good. Yeah. He's the only one the opposition has. I wish we had. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been a lot of speeches made here tonight, so I'm going to make mine very short. <laughs> I appreciate the magnificent tributes made to me. And all I've got to say is, my platform's my record. And I stand on my record. Now, if there are any questions anyone would like to ask, I'll be glad to see what I can do with them. No! The lady down here. You have a question, miss? Uh, my question is, why are you running for Congress? <laughs> no, 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 let the little lady speak, no. Why do you ask that question, miss? Because, Mr. Finley, I'd like to know how you, with your record, can ask these people to vote for you. Well, I'll match my record with any man's. <laughs> this record that Mr. Finley will match with anyone's is as follows. In 1930, Alderman Finley's brother-in-law, Oscar Nordstrom, started getting the snow cleaning contract and received it every year for the 10 years that Mr. Finley sat on the city council. And in 1932 and 1933, Alderman Finley said the bread lines were costing the city too much money and even went to the extent of trying to put through a bill to force apple sellers to buy licenses. And in 1934... The speakers in support of Mr. Finley had barely concluded when a young woman rose from the floor to challenge the party selection. Been checking since then on her identity. And this beautiful blonde is a second maid employed in Congressman Morley's special home on the lakefront. She couldn't have been more of a bombshell if she'd been planted by the opposition. Or was she? Well, were you? Uh, I've been thinking ever since I got home. I'll leave here tonight. That's smart. That's using your head. You know what they'll say about me then, don't you? What will they say? They'll say I threw you out. They'll say I'm against freedom of speech. They... They'll call me a fascist. Right. I need an ask. You do what Mr. Morley says. You stay right here and keep your mouth shut. This election's in the bag. All right. Uh, uh, uh. Why don't you let me answer it for a while, Mr. Clancy? Because if they don't get a statement out of Glenn, they'll try and pry one out of you. Mm -hmm. Hello? No, you can't talk to anybody. Who? Oh, hold the wire. Katie, wait a minute. That's Ward Hughes. Who? The head man of the opposition party. Mm -hmm. He's okay, a little too honest, maybe. He wants to talk to you. To me? Go ahead. Be careful what you say to him. Yes. Hello, Mr. Hughes? Yes? I don't know anything about her, except sometimes, if you're lucky, you can put over a freak. Ward, she's wholesome looking for the women. A servant girl for the labor boat, corn fed for the farmers. Swedish for the foreign born. And for my dough, she's got something for the men. What have we got to lose? I feel all we can do is gain. Well, shall we give her the pitch? Oh, oh, bring, bring her in. Bring her in. Okay, Eddie. Will you go in now, Miss Holstrom? Thank you. Oh, come in, Miss Holstrom. Mrs. Brown, Mr. Evans, do do? Mr. Briscoe, Mr. Ryan, Miss Corbett, Mr. Silvey. Miss Holstrom, sit down. 
Thank you for being so patient, Miss Elster. No, one or two things we had to talk over. And uh, it comes down to this. Uh, our party honestly hasn't the right candidate. Now, last night you were pretty positive about what kind of a congressman you didn't want. I was hoping you'd be just as positive as to what you did want. What I think doesn't matter so much. It... No, go ahead, Miss Holstrom. Tell us what sort of a representative you'd like. Someone who'd represent... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean represent all of us. Uh, to me, once a person is elected to office, he has a great duty to all the people. He, he shouldn't just represent the men who, who gave money to his advertisements and campaign. And he shouldn't be in office to serve just the politicians. He should serve the people. He should know what the people want and vote for what they want. Thank you, Miss Holstrom. Thank you for giving us our candidate. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Hughes. I I'm glad I was able to be of some assistance to you. You'll run, of course. Me? Yes. Hair Cute, what have I done? Mrs. Morley, my taxi is here. Are you really going through with this, Katie? I have to. Katie, I'll miss you. Oh, thank you. I'm afraid Mr. Morley is a little mad at me. Don't let her do it, Ma. She won't listen to me. How could I stop her? But it's what she wants to do. Why, it's ridiculous. Look, here's this girl. Uh, Catherine Holstrom. Catherine Holstrom, right. A bunch of opportunists taking advantage of the fact that she made a sensation of herself at the auditorium the other night, and now giving us some song and dance about being able to elect her representative from the 13th District, in spite of the power and experience of our party. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know anything about politics. Mm -hmm. How can she, I ask you, be expected to give off on such things as the minimum wage bill, the full employment bill, the... Missouri Valley, the Columbia Valley, authorities' amendments, uh, permanent FEPC, atomic bomb controls, anti-poll tax, uh, national, well, a hundred other things. Can you? Well, that's beside the point. I'm already a congressman. Oh. Go on, Dan. Well, what right is she to run anyway? Who asked her? Did the people send a mandate? Did the angels bring a message? No. Well, why don't you stop her? We have no right to stop her. Katie? Start running for Congress. I give up. You know, when you leave here, you're just a girl who's been working in this house. You become a candidate for the United States House of Representatives, running on an opposition ticket. Further, I don't think you're the least qualified to run. I mean to use every device in my power to defeat you. Yes, Mrs. Morley. Goodbye, Katie, dear. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, aren't you going to wish me luck, too? Good luck, Katie. Goodbye. It's a rotten shame to take a nice girl like that and just toss her in a den of lions. Your concern wouldn't be because you're in love with her, would it? Well, of course not. It's just that she's a very, very sweet girl and uh, fair play. Uh, in love with her. <laughs> Because you can't bear to say goodbye to me. Yeah. I guess that must be it. Well, let you in on something, Katie. What? Might bring you luck. Oh. For over 40 years now, I've been voting for the Morleys. Yeah. This time, I'm going to vote for you. Oh. That's not changing anything. Because in my book, you're Morley people. Go ahead, driver. <laughs> an eternal and happy peace. I shall work for the rights of all people, no matter what their color or religion, and I shall support every measure that endorses and furthers these rights. I thank you. Yes? Hello, Kate.
Katie. Oh, Mr. Morley. I dropped by because I'm on my way to Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I am here to ask you... No, no, Miss Holstrom, wait. Opening speech, take 12. Begin. Ladies and... Oh, <laughs> recording machine. Yes, I, uh, I make the speeches and we listen. Oh, uh, Congressman Morley, these are my brothers. Peter. Peter. Congressman. And Sven. Congressman. Sven. And uh, this is Olaf. <laughs> Olaf. Oh, and uh, Mr. Winder, oh. my diction teacher. Hello. How do you do? Was that your first speech I just heard? Uh, yes, you see, my problem for Miss Holstrom is to give her voice body and size. And I think we're coming along very well. You do? I do. Uh, do, do you like it, Mr. Morley? I'm afraid I'm not in a position to... No, no, go yeah, ahead and tell us. We want to know what you think. You know, On the basis of the few words that Mr. Morley has heard, I don't think he's in a position to judge. As a matter of fact, I am in a position to judge. There's nothing wrong with the speech except the way you make her say it. I think it's outrageous. You do? I do. That's what I've been telling you for the last now, three days. Don't listen to what I'm saying. No, no, no. It's too late to calm down. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I suggest you conclude your business with Congressman Morley so we can go ahead. You go ahead now. Out. I beg your pardon. He said go on out. Beat it. You're out of a job, Mr. Winder. Go now, Mr. Winder. It will be safer. See here, I'm not accustomed to this being, this being. Where, where are you taking me? Put me down. Put me down. I insist. Say goodbye. Well. Sorry if I did anything to create an unpleasant situation, but I really don't think Please don't point. worry about it. My brothers were ready to throw him out a long time ago. Hello? Congressman Morley, yes? All right. Your driver's downstairs. He says if you want to make that plane, you'll have to leave in a few minutes. Tell him I'll be right down, please. All right. Leave you right down. I came to say goodbye because at the house, I, I, I didn't say goodbye the way I wanted to. Thank you very much. Good luck, Katie. Mm -hmm. Every kind of good luck. Just a minute, Congressman. You can't go now. You must stay and tell Katrin what she's doing wrong and how she should do it oh, right. Oh, needs your help. He has to make his plane. Instead he of wasting two minutes talking about the plane, he could be telling you what to do. Please tell, tell her. What to do. Well, uh, look, Katie. Just, just remember why you've been chosen as a candidate. I saw you at the rally. You got up on your feet and spoke simply and honestly about what you felt. That's the way you've got to talk through the entire campaign. You mustn't be giving bad imitations of a lot of bad speech makers. You can't win by yelling in a loud voice and waving your hand and tearing at your hair and going into a lot of double talk. You've got to talk like... Mr. Clancy told me how simply you read my father's speech that day in the library. Talk like that. Just... just... be yourself. Try it again. Here. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I want to ask you for the most precious thing you own, your vote. That's, That's good. good. That's no way to do it. Congressman Morley, thanks. <laughs> Why, he did more in two minutes and wider than two weeks. Said what a Congressman. Sure she come on, Catherine. Yeah. Get up on the platform and talk. Yeah, come Let on, Mr. Catherine. Morley hear yeah, for once. All right. Yes, you go ahead. I'll stay as long as I can. Go on now, Captain. The power and right. This power and right to vote is something you must cherish and guard with courage and dignity. When someone asks you for your vote, you must be jealous of that vote. You must ask yourself, who is it I am voting for? What kind of a person? What does he stand for? What does he believe in? Nothing wrong can happen to you, the people, if you will use your vote properly. And no one man or... Go on, Go Captain. On, don't Captain. stop. Captain. Wonderful. Yeah, don't stop now. No one man or group of men can hurt you if you will use your power of a free and honest election. <laughs>
just ran this on the machine. I can't understand it. Mrs. Morley says she can. 48% for that girl. With our machine, after all the money we've spent, Finley ought to be at least 85% two days before election. Has Glenn left Washington yet? He's leaving by plane tonight. Have you seen these? He's due here at 6.30 tomorrow morning. He'll make four speeches in the district, then we'll put him on the radio tomorrow night. He's got to get in there and slug. Not that I'm worried, of course, but this girl's been getting away with murder. Come in. Excuse me. There's a man here says he wants to see whoever's in charge of Mr. Finley's campaign. What does he want? He says it's very confidential. He couldn't tell it to anyone but the boss. All right, send him in. Will you come in, please? Thank you. How are you, gentlemen? And lady? Oh. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Finley. How do you do? I guess you don't remember me, Mr. Finley, but we have met on a number of occasions. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Glad to see you again. You wanted to see me? Uh... If you're the boss... He's the boss. Is it okay if I talk in front of, uh... I mean, what I have to say is uh, kind of confidential. Okay, sit down. What can we do for you? <laughs> well, there's a kind of talk going around that, uh... This here, Katie's running away with the election. Katie? You know her? I'm the one who brought her to Capital City. Friend of the family. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, stayed with her folks up in the country. I, I'm a painter, see? I painted her folks' barn. Get to the point. Well, gentlemen and lady, I'm here in the interests of good American citizenship. I don't think that a tramp should run for Congress. And I got some, uh, some very personal information about this, Katie about a night she stayed at a motel where, uh, due to circumstances, there was only one of... What's your point in coming here with this information? Like I told you, ma'am, uh, good citizenship, uh, the right representative for our Congress, and... Uh, I suppose well, you expect some expression of our gratitude? No, ma'am. I don't expect to get anything for this. <coughs> but things has been a little rugged in the painting business. <coughs> If I could uh, lay my hands on a couple of hundred dollars so I could go away and get rid of this. <coughs> Hi, open the window. Let's get some air in here. What kind of a campaign do you think we are running? Now get out of here before I throw you out. I can prove it. I was there, you sir. You heard what the man said. Now go on, beat Don't it. Don't take my word for it. I wonder if he could prove it. It's an obvious piece of blackmail. For $500, that man would sell out Finley if he wanted to. A fellow comes in with a perfectly good story. We don't even listen to him. We throw him out of the office. What goes around here? Are we for me or are we for Katie? I haven't quite made up my mind. That may be very funny to you, Mrs. Morley, but I've spent 20 years of my life in politics. I can match that and add 20. Oh, I know. I uh, guess I'm a little bit jumpy, Mrs. Morley. Forgive me. I have no complaints. You put on a swell show. Anything you say is okay with me. I know I'd be a dead duck if it weren't for you. Well, there's nothing more I can do around here today, folks, so I guess I'll run along and check with some of the boys. see for yourself, Glenn. It's fully documented. That first one is the farmer's sworn statement. He's the one Katie paid $50 damages to. The other one's the mechanic. He got $25 from Katie to fix Adolph's Jeep. And here's one from the woman who ran the motel. All sworn statements, Glenn. You people have been as busy as little beavers, haven't you? Must have worked all night to get here so early in the morning. Who asked you to do this anyway? Now, just a minute, Glenn. This is a hot story. Notable enough dynamite to blast this cheap no account. Shut up. Glenn, we've got to be practical. This is a campaign. In politics, you use every break you get. Virginia, don't print that story. Why, Glenn Morley, I seem to remember you on a platform saying, quote, I'll fight for free speech and freedom of the press. Now, look, I know I'm in no position to insist. You're in no you. position, period. Now, stop this, both of you. Remember this, Agatha. They go to the polls tomorrow morning at 7, and we stand a darn good chance of getting our ears pinned back. Now, you tell Glenn, do we want to win this election or don't we? I'm sorry it had to come to this. I suppose we have to win an election. Hello?
This is Thatcher. Give me the press room, please. Hello, Carl? Hold it, Virginia. Hi. If you let her print that story, I quit the party. Sorry to hear you take that attitude, Glenn. Don't like to think of a Morley leaving the party. When your father died, it was a little tough for us for a while, but we made it all right. I guess we can make it again. If you're going over to warn the opposition, don't bother. The story's in type and ready to roll. Okay, Carl, start running. Miss Holstrom, please. Miss Holstrom's not here. Where is she? I don't know. Just a moment. Where's Katie? Congratulations, Morley. Where is she? She left an hour ago. We were tipped off then that the story was in type. Where'd she go? Morley, this is a rotten way to win an election. Even if it's true, you shouldn't what have What do you mean, it. even if it's true? She went back with her brothers to their farm. Eddie. Yes, sir? Call the party workers to stand by. I have a slight hunt. Something's liable to pop. What? How do I know? This is politics. Mrs. Holstrom? Yeah. Oh, can you tell me where Yeah, I... yeah. Oh, thank you. I, uh, thank you. Yeah, I know. From your picture. Thank you. Oh, it's sad this had to happen. Sad for Catherine and sad for the people that love her. I know how you feel because I love her too. We want to be married, Papa. And you come to me for permission? Yeah. Did you come to me for permission when you run away from Capital City and quit? I told you before. You told me lots of things. You asked me nothing. You wanted to quit too? I thought it'd be the easiest thing for Katie. Yeah, the easiest thing. 
The easiest thing when I come here 40 years ago would be to let the earth lie dead, unplowed. The easiest thing would be for me not to raise a family and make them believe the things I believe. So, you want to get married. Well, go ahead. This is not important to me. I thought that Catherine was married to the truth. But now that she wants to quit and that you want her to, I don't care whether you get married or not. Are you trying to make me feel ashamed, Papa? Yeah, but only ashamed for quitting. If you want to be in Congress, then you must fight. How can a woman fight the kind of lies they've been printing about her? If she goes back, they'll simply print more lies. He's I don't to care what they say in papers or anywhere else. Woman or man, if you don't want to fight for the truth, then you shouldn't be in Congress. Will you help me fight? Mr. Holstrom, I wish I had you for my campaign manager. <laughs> oh, Good. darling. You make fine son-in-law. I hope. I know, from your picture. Close the door. Glenn, where on earth are you talking from? Oh, how is Katie? I suppose you think that comes as a big surprise to me. They're going to be married. I like that. I wish we hadn't walked out of here quite so fast this morning. I've had a very interesting guest for the past couple of hours. Ah, interesting guest. You stay there and wait for my call. All right, Glenn. Agatha, how long are you going to let that fella hang around here? Stick around, Joseph. Things may get more interesting. Bring that in. Congratulations. On the wedding, I mean. Thank you. Maybe I can give Glenn a wedding present. Here's how. I've just been having a little drink with a senator. Thank you. You know, it's a great privilege to be chatting with you socially in your home, Mrs. Morley. You're practically a legend in this state, you and the senator. Allow me, sir. I don't really think... No, just one more, and uh, make it short. You know, Mr. Finley, you've been a great service to the party. <laughs> Yeah, but you didn't believe Adolf the first time he came in, did you? There's only one thing that's worrying me, Mr. Findlay. What's that? You must have paid him a lot of money. I think the party should give it back to you. Oh, don't worry about Joseph. He's been a Morley for years. But I know he knows. Well, that's good enough for me, Joe. I'll tell you a little secret. I gave Adolf 500. You're not going to turn that house painter loose with all that money. Oh, no. I got him in protective custody till after the election. In a safe place, I hope. In my lodge up in Kaluma Lake, nobody's going to go that far to look for it. Mm. And if they do, they'll be sorry. I got my toughest boys guarding him. Your boys? You have your own machine, Mr. Finley. It's a national organization the boys and I belong to. You're looking far ahead. I suppose you have a name for your organization. Oh, yes, indeed. We've got to stay undercover for a while, but we're doing a beautiful job. We've got a great plan mapped out to educate the public. What do you want the public to believe, Mr. Finley? I want them to believe in our type of 100% Americanism. Now, 100% American is... White. Right. No foreign born. Right. The right kind of religion. Exactly right, Mrs. Morley. I guess I know where you stand. You're leaving this house now or I'm going to throw you out. Joseph, how dare you talk to one of my guests like that? You're not serious about this. Joseph, I'm afraid we'll have to speak about this later. Mrs. Morley, I'm not accustomed to speaking about things later. Mr. Finley, I'm afraid I have let Joseph throw you out. What kind of double-crossing deal is this? I'm counting three. Mrs. Morley! I'm going. Mr. Finley! You forgot your hood! Will there be any... 
Anything else, Mrs. Morley? Yes, Joseph. Get Glenn on the telephone right away. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Who's going on the radio, Captain or Glenn? We'll know more about it when he's through talking to his mother on the phone. Oh. Fellows know a shortcut to Kaluma Lake? I do. That's where we fish. We're going fishing. Yeah? For eight hours. Oh, I can't oh. wait. Glenn! Wait a minute. Now, look. Getting Adolf out of Finley's place may be a pretty rough deal. Oh, Glenn, if I don't go, Papa will give it to me good and plenty. Oh, no. I'm not quitting on anything anymore. Wait a minute! Harry Selby. Well, what do you know? I hate to disturb you at this late hour, but I wonder if you could direct me to the uh, O'Shea Lodge. This ain't it. Oh, I know it's on the North Shore. This is the South Shore. Yes, I know. I must have taken the wrong fork in the road. You see, I used to live here some years ago, but uh, well, they've changed the signs or something. Uh, then everything was dirt roads and you could find things easily. Uh, how long have you lived around here? I'm a tourist. Oh, <laughs> you... and the North Shore is right around the lake. On the opposite side of the South Shore. How do you get there? You get a car? Oh, yes, I've got one of those new models. It's a... Well, drive it. This car ain't one of ours. Finley was right. Well, wouldn't it be easier to go by boat? Yeah, it would be easier to go by boat, but I ain't got a boat. Oh, you can get boats now. I saw a cruise advertised the other day. O'Shea's got a beauty. Look, Mr. CB, I'm, I'm trying... Sal Selby, uh... Harry Selby, uh, tractors and farm equipment. We got out a new Look, line. Mr. Selby, go away. Beat it. We're very busy in here right now. I got my friend in here in a triple blitz. Oh, I'm good. Now go away, beat it, and give my regards to your friend O'Shea. Oh, do you know O'Shea? Oh, I don't know O'Shea, and I don't care if I ah, get it. Sir. Take it back! stick with the party if we dump Finley and say so publicly. But that's going to be impossible and Call up the newspapers and get out an extra. But how are we going Mission about getting up an extra? Mission of Katie and get it on the radio. Yeah, but you can't tell All the whole of this town. must be done by 7 o'clock. But I... That's what the man said, hi. <laughs> Hello? Yes? 
What? Yes. The party withdraws its support unconditionally from Anders J. Finley and urges all voters to back the candidacy of Catherine Holstrom. Well, call up the landlady and get the name straight. I guess. We now bring you an exclusive interview with Adolf Petrie. I lied, and I'm sorry I lied. Everything I said about Katie is a lie. Mr. Finley gave me $500 to lie about Katie. This is Katrin Holstrom. I am very grateful for the trust and the confidence placed in me. And I promise that I will do everything in my power to fulfill that trust. <laughs> Five minutes from now, the polls will open. I urge you, as citizens who want good government... Let me repeat. Our party's withdrawn support from Anders J. Finley unconditionally. We urge you to go to the polls this morning and vote for Katrin Holstrom. Good! <laughs> Mr. Finley was my leader, and it was an order. He said, once a member of the organization, always a member of the organization. And I knew what would happen if I didn't obey. So... I swore to all the lies he told me to say. I'm not quite sure of the protocol in a case like this, but... 